All right. Thank you all very much for joining us uh, for this second of three live streaming uh, Forest and Fire Learning Series events. Uh, we hope that you are all staying healthy and happy and safe and sane uh, at home. And uh, when I go ahead and introduce myself, I am Emily Swindell and I work with Mount Studies Institute as a uh, forest program associate. And though this is the second Facebook live event that we're hosting, we just want to say thank you for your patience as we continue to learn how to best live stream these events while simultaneously interacting with all of you out there. So please remember, as I said last week, uh, your hosts and experts for this evening are in some form or another scientists not social media gurus. So, uh, so I wanna give you a brief background to the learning series real quick. Um, Mountain Studies Institutes, along with several local partners, started this three-part learning series in 2018, as we were entering a period of exceptional drought in many areas throughout the Southwest. Uh, and we decided to put together a community event in order to spark community engagement and awareness about the current state of our forests and how we as a community could begin addressing some of the challenges that are facing our forests, our natural resources, and our communities. So at a time like this, it is important to remember that ecosystems continue to function without regard to our current crisis and stay-at-home orders that many of us are experiencing. And that we still have to be aware of what's happening in our environments in which we live, and uh, which in the Southwest um, has meant wide fluctuations in precipitation and snowpack and shifts in seasonal temperature for the last several years. So this learning series is really meant to be an ongoing conversation between the public, city and emergency planners, land managers, scientists, academics, and researchers about what's going on in our forests and how we may continue to cultivate uh, resilience in our communities in a time right now of physical and social distancing. So, um, I do want to thank um, our sponsors. We are very fortunate to have a number of sponsors for this event um, that include Wildfire Adaptive Partnership, Southern Rockies Fire Science Network, uh, the San Juan Citizens Alliance, Garden Schwartz Outdoors, Outdoor, Durango Outdoor Exchange, Four Corners, River Sports, Maria's Bookshop, the Colorado State Forest Service, uh, the Powerhouse Science Center, which is where we would have held this event, uh, were we able to. The San Juan Headwaters Forest Health Partnership, the 232 Cohesive Strategy Partnership, the Dolores Watership Resilient Forest Collaborative, and SCA Brewing here in Durango, Colorado. So thank you very much to all of our sponsors for this evening. And we also wanna give a very special thanks to Four Corners River Sports and SCA Brewing, for donating the items for tonight's free giveaway, which includes two single day stand up paddle boarding, kayak or canoe rentals and two cases of Skagwa. Uh, and if you're curious, two cases equals, that's going to be eight six packs for you to enjoy while you're on the water. So uh, to be eligible for tonight's giveaway, you must be 18 years of age or older, you must like or follow Mountain Studies Institute on our Facebook page if you aren't already or if you haven't liked it already. And you must fill out the survey that's going to be pinned to the comment section of this live event. Um, we will then announce a randomly selected winner on our Facebook page tomorrow, April 9th. And then we will allow you one week to respond um, and that's going to be until Wednesday, April 15th, when we're going to have our third and final learning series event. Um, and at that point, um, you know, hopefully you've already responded and we can figure out a way to get these awesome prizes to you. Um, and 
We also want to say that whether or not you would like to win these, these great prizes, um, we, we do ask that you please take about two minutes to fill out the survey that will be pinned to the top of the comment section, which will help us provide more relevant information to you in the future. So we really appreciate you taking a tiny bit of time uh, in order to check that out. Um, so here we go, sorry about that. So um, let's get going here. So, uh, so tonight's program, um, we're going to have two sets of amazing speakers this evening, each presenting for about 20 to 30 minutes. And after each presentation, we're going to open it up to your questions which you can type in the comment section of this live event. Um, but don't feel like you have to wait until the speakers are done with their presentations. If you, um, if you think of a question while they're presenting, go ahead and write it in the comment section. And my colleague, Dana Hayward, who's gonna be rocking the Facebook side of this event, will be relaying your questions to our speakers. Um, so go ahead and write in the comments section as you think of questions for our speakers so we can go ahead and get that queued up for when they're done with their presentations. Um, so without further ado, um, our first set of speakers uh, will begin with Dr. Lorraine Taylor and Dr. Elizabeth Cartier. Uh, Dr. Taylor is an assistant professor of management in the School of Business Administration at Fort Lewis College. She joined the college in 2013 and teaches in the Tourism and Hospitality Management Concentration and the Certificate in Ski Resort Operations. Dr. Taylor's research interests include tourist decision-making, motivations in niche tourism, spurious loyalty, and vacation guilt. She began her career working in the hotel industry for Walt Disney World, Marriott International, and the five-star and five-diamond rated sanctuary at Kiowa Island Golf Resort. She also worked as a hotel inspector for Condé Nast Johansson's, a series of travel reference guides. Dr. Taylor is a scholarship reviewer for Tourism Cares, a nonprofit organization that strives to preserve and enhance the travel experience for future generations through domestic and global volunteer programs and events. In the academic community, she is a member of the executive committee for the Greater Western Chapter of the Travel and Tourism Research Association. And locally, she serves as the vice chair for the board of directors for Visit Durango. Elizabeth A. Cartier, PhD, is an assistant professor of management in the School of Business Administration at Fort Lewis College. She joined the college in the 2018-2019 academic year. And prior to joining Fort Lewis, Dr. Cartier was a visiting assistant professor at the University of New Mexico and a lecturer at Arizona State University Colleges at Lake Havasu. Dr. Cartier's teaching focuses on organizational behavior, human resources, and decision-making. While pursuing her PhD at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, she received the Eisenberg Doctoral Teaching Award in 2015. Dr. Cartier's research concentrates on tourism impacts, the critical aspects of power and control, gender and social inequality, and the relationship between discourse and power. She has published articles in the Journal of Travel Research and the Journal of Tourism and Hospitality Insights. Dr. Cartier's practical experience was focused in the hospitality industry, where she worked in restaurants in Massachusetts, New York, and in Colorado. She is currently active professionally, assisting her husband with his restaurant, Jabo's Pizza and Ribco here in Durango, Colorado. Uh, when Dr. Cartier is not at the fort, or at the restaurant, she can be found enjoying the North Country of Durango, skiing, fishing, or hiking. So um, from here, I'll go ahead and hand it off to you, Dr. Lorraine Taylor. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Emily. I appreciate that introduction. I wanna make sure my screen is shared with everyone here. 
All right, uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to be invited to the speaker series. Thank you to the Mountain Studies Institute for inviting us. I'll be co-presenting tonight with Dr. Liz Cartier, and we'll be presenting the findings of a study that we conducted called Living in a Wildfire, the relationship between crisis management and community resilience in a tourism-based destination. Uh, and this was published, I apologize, earlier this year in a journal called Tourism Management Perspectives. <clears throat> Today, our goal is to go through our study. I'll be introducing ourselves as well as our project and then providing some background information on the literature review. And then Dr. Cartier will be sharing the methods, results, and discussion of our study and will both be available to answer any questions or address any comments that you have about this project. I wanted to be very upfront about our areas of expertise and what we are knowledgeable about and also be clear that we are not experts in fires or forests, just to be clear on what questions we're capable of answering at the end of this project. Um, but as we mentioned, we are both assistant professors in management in the School of Business Administration, and we both have experience working in the hospitality industry. Dr. Cartier teaches courses in business administration, including introduction to business decision-making, organizational behavior, human resources, and ski resort management. And prior to this project in crisis management really focused her research on power and control and discourse and gender and social inequality. And earlier today was at a board meeting for um, music in the mountains. The courses that I teach with my experience uh, working in resorts are tourism and hospitality management, sustainable tourism, event management, ski resort operations. Uh, and prior to this, project in crisis management, did research in tourist motivations and behavior. And I started here in 2013 and marijuana was a topic that was of concern to the tourism industry. So I spent several years doing research in that area. And then earlier today, I had a, a board meeting for the Visit Durango, the local tourism office. And so the impetus for this study really came from a call for papers for that journal that I mentioned. They had a special issue on crisis management and resiliency. And what we found uh, was that we felt it was irresponsible for us not to acknowledge what was happening in our very backyard. And so I had done a project on the Gold King mine spill in 2015, which many of you probably remember. Um, I did that project with a student and then uh, Dr. Cartier and I took on this project related to the 416 fire. And we simply noticed that the frequency and fury of crises have flourished over the past decade. And that was something that we couldn't ignore and felt that we needed to uh, get involved in this to understand what the impacts were in our community. And so since neither of us was an expert in crisis management, we really had to dig into the literature to see what was out there already. And what we found was uh, a variety of different layers of research that we had to look at. And so the first is this layer of individual reactions. And we find that there's complex systems of human and natural interactions and that they don't exist in a vacuum. Uh, quite the opposite, there's a lot of interdependency between the human impacts and the natural impacts. And we um, were looking into that further. Another thing that came up repeatedly in our research was uh, the triple bottom line of sustainability and looking at the impacts uh, economically, socially, and environmentally, and not just in those three pillars separately, but also how they interact. Um, in terms of the recovery process, there's a lot of research on the importance of communication and effective communication is critically important since everyone is operating in an environment of uncertainty. And so when decisions are making to their choices in isolation, there tends to be a lot of redundancy and confusion. And so uh, it's recommended in the literature that frequent and transparent communication and a collaborative approach is recommended. I'm sorry, my, my very environmentally friendly light sensors just went off. Um, okay, in terms of tourism leadership, we find that um, this is really related to destination image and the, uh, the perception that potential visitors have of a destination. And it's the responsibility of tourism leaders uh, during and after a crisis to try to protect that uh, destination brand. Uh, and this is, uh, critically important because there are competing destinations that will try to take advantage of that period of vulnerability in a destination that's experiencing a crisis. 
And then crises are not linear. Uh, they don't behave the way that we want them to and they don't behave sequentially. And so the resilience process really requires constant monitoring of the crisis itself and also the effectiveness of the recovery efforts. So also in the, in the literature, we found that there were calls for more research on a few things, including the relationship between resilience, tourism crisis management and sustainability, which is another reason why we embedded sustainability in our project, and then uh, destination development and management from a resilience perspective. And I will uh, touch on resiliency on the next slide. Okay, so to give you a background on our research, we really wanted to emphasize this resilience viewpoint. And since uh, cultivating resiliency is the theme of uh, this week's session, I wanted to share with you the uh, definition of resilience that we used for our study is, it is the capacity of a system to absorb a disturbance and then reorganize to attain the original function and structure. And so we really borrowed the approach of an academic named Hall out of New Zealand, who has a widely accepted view that resilience is a process rather than an outcome. Um, we see a lot of resilience work coming out of New Zealand because they had the um, earthquake crises that they were dealing with for several years. We're seeing more research come out of Australia with their fire season last year. And a lot of our literature actually comes from the University of Florida where they do research on hurricanes. And so we're finding, um, uh, these are the areas where we're uh, finding research being published. We also were using a critical constructivist lens. And so uh, this was a qualitative study where we used a uh, qualitative methodology as neutral observers of a phenomenon. But with, with this critical approach, we're seeking to understand the multidimensionality of the experience for those who were impacted by the fire. And so by uh, researching them, interviewing them, um, and looking at secondary data, the results are to emerge from that data collection process. Um, the goal of the study overall was to identify the relationship between crisis management procedures and local resilience processes. And this was guided by two overarching research questions. The first was what practices impact resilience processes during disaster events? And then how can these processes be managed sustainably according to that triple bottom line? And obviously our context was the 416 fire in Durango during the summer of 2018. So digging a little deeper into the related literature, we were looking at sort of these three big buckets um, of tourism research. One was in crisis management and uh, the uh, literature shows that crisis impacts are both direct and indirect. And I was uh, thinking about an example to provide. And so we obviously have um, some people who we interviewed for this study were evacuees and being evacuated is a direct impact of the crisis. There were area closures and people were forced to evacuate. There are also indirect effects and this includes things like the multiplier effect. And so some of the people who are inconvenienced by the fire, they may have been employees of businesses who were unable to offer 100% of their normal shifts and wages, or they may have been employers or owners of businesses that had to close the business temporarily. And in those cases, their income is lowered and they have less of an ability to spend money at other locally owned businesses. And that's an example of an indirect effect where we see the multiplier effect in play. Another thing that comes up often in the literature is the critical importance of communication. And so we find that one of the biggest stressors during and after a crisis is trying to make decisions uh, that aren't informed because you don't have all the information. And so this is another emphasis on uh, transparent and frequent communication so that people have uh, reduced stress when it comes to making decisions because they have information to be informed. Um, we also find that uh, each decision changes the context in which the other decision makers are operating. And so like we said, how crises aren't linear, the context is constantly changing. An example I can give of this as a board member for Visit Durango, when the tourism office, for example, makes a decision, that ends up changing the context in which, let's say, the president of the Colorado Restaurant Association in the Durango chapter, um, that person, their context has changed for where they make decisions or the president of the local hotel and lodgers association, their context gets changed. And so um, it's really important to be constantly monitoring that context and know that a decision you make today may not have the same impact that it would tomorrow. 
Another big bucket of the literature is destination resilience in the local community. And here we can demonstrate, as I mentioned, that resilience is a process and not just a single goal or a static point. Um, and it shows the four abilities of a community to plan for the crisis, absorb the crisis, recover from the crisis, and adapt to the crisis. And what's important here is to think of this as a cycle. And so when you're adapting from your current crisis, you're actually planning for a future crisis. And as we see today, we expect that this frequency and fury of crises will continue um, to escalate in the future. And then last but not least, uh, in the tourism and crisis big bucket of research, we find that community level decision makers are really imperative. And so during a crisis, um, individuals or business owners can get tunnel vision and they're making very micro level decisions about themselves and their own business. Um, and it's critically important to have people who are thinking about the success of the destination at that regional level and not just thinking about individuals or single businesses. And so um, the consideration of the impacts not only on the tourism industry, but also in other industries is really important here. All right, and now it is my pleasure to pass it off to my colleague, Dr. Cartier. Okay, just trying to figure out how to share my screen. Okay, I think that I'm in. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. So as Dr. Taylor said, the way that we were looking at this study is we wanted to see the relationship between crisis management procedures and resiliency processes. We wanted to see what crisis management procedures were doing that were impacting the resiliency process. As Dr. Taylor said, the setting of this research was in Durango, Colorado during the 416 fire. The reason that we chose the 416 fire is that we were both indirectly and directly impacted by the fire. So we felt it was a prime location for us to really contribute to what we know about the fire and how we're kind of doing things right now. Uh, the fire started on June 1st, 2018, and the actual end of the fire was right around November 30th, although the majority of the fire really happened between June and July. In order to look at the research questions that Dr. Taylor talked about, we use two types of data collection. We use primary data as well as secondary data. Our primary data consisted of semi-structured interviews, which means we interviewed a number of people, and when we interview them, we didn't give them certain structures, but instead we let them lead the discussion. We were able to perform 15 interviews in early 2019. So we were able to get those interviews right after the end of the fire. Some of our interviewees were local business owners, some were managers of local hospitality and tourism businesses, and some were city and state employees. And then between the two, there were a number that were evacuees, or I'm sorry, between the three, there were a number that were evacuees, as well as on pre-evacuation status. The way that we found these interviews or these interviewees was either through personal connection or people who held uh, predominant positions within the community. In order to support the primary data, we then collected secondary data. In secondary data, we looked at the Durango Herald. The Herald had approximately 350 articles that really focused on the 416 fire. These articles came out between June 1st and November 30th. So we looked through all of these articles and we decided on 34 of a random sample. These 34 articles could be focused on or were focused on crisis management articles, tourism articles, and resilience articles. So this secondary data was used to support our primary data of secondary, or I'm sorry, semi-structured interviews. What we did with this data is we analyzed it using qualitative content analysis with gerund coding techniques. And basically what that means is that we were looking at and for different themes that were coming up in the data, as well as different categories of things. This particular type of analysis was how we determined the 15 interviews in the 34 articles because of the saturation effect. So when we started to see things repeated over and over and over again, we knew that we had collected enough data. And although 15 interviews and 34 articles don't necessarily seem like a lot, we are hoping to develop this in the future to kind of continue our results. So what did this actually give us? So when I think about our overall findings, and I should say we had over 900 themes that we concluded with our findings after we looked at our 15 interviews in our 34 articles. On the right-hand side of the screen, you're gonna see the four main findings that we had of four buckets of categories that these 900 themes fit in. I'm gonna talk about each one of these four in detail, but before I go into that, I wanna talk about one of our major, major findings that we found 
through these interviews and sifting through of these secondary sources. And that would be the two squares that are in the middle of your screen. One of the main findings that we found was that with the 416 fire, there were actually two periods of resiliency and two very different periods of resiliency. One was resiliency that happened during the crisis. when We had a threat towards people, towards houses, towards buildings from the fire. And then the next was how we continue that resiliency and what happened with that change in resiliency once the threat was no longer predominant on the city and was predominant on the people. So this two dyadic timeframes of resiliency was a huge portion of our data collection and a huge portion of our findings. So I'm gonna start first by talking about what happened during the crisis. So during the crisis, we realized that resiliency was being built in this community based on two things. The first one was based on communication. We realized right away, and this was consistent with a lot of the research that Dr. Taylor talked about, and a lot of the research that we put together, that communicating encouraged resiliency. And two pieces of this encouraged resiliency. Everybody that we talked to, as well as the articles that we sifted to, focus on the idea that we need constant communication in crisis. It doesn't matter if the communication is negative. It doesn't matter if the communication is about the fire building and growing and growing. We just want communication. One informant said, the fact that you have all that communication makes you feel better about the situation. It makes you feel like you are more in control of the situation than you would be if you didn't know what was going on. It makes you feel like you are part of the team that is out there. When we have communication, that communication gives us the ability to feel a sense of control. That communication is also connected to the feeling of calm. One informant said, you know when you don't have information or you don't hear something for a while, your brain takes over and sometimes you can't trust your brain. So the more communication we had, the more that our brains would reduce and instead we would take that information and take it as a piece of the resiliency process. So the constant communication, as well as the communication in order to be calm. The second piece of the resiliency process that happened during the actual fire was about identifying as a resilient community. It became quite apparent to us from our interviews as well as sifting through of secondary sources that in order to be resilient, the community needed to see themselves as one. Three major categories that we had were a number of people wanting to help, feeling that we were a collective here in Durango, and then caring our about our neighbors. One informant said, I mean, they literally kept going. It was, I'm gonna keep working. They didn't even know if they were going to get paid. I was getting text messages. What can I do? I just don't wanna sit around. This was from an informant that had a business that was thinking about how this fire was gonna impact them. And they shared this ability to want to help, to identify as that resilient community. Under being a collective, one informant said, even though the smoke was crazy here and sometimes you couldn't go outside because of the smoke pollution, it was like everyone was so happy, so upbeat, like we got this. You know we are together, we are a team, we are a community, we are Durango. And then lastly, on the right-hand side, a quote from the newspaper or an article in the newspaper about caring about neighbors. These were our friends and neighbors out battling massive flames that were traveling in alarming pace in extreme conditions. And it went on, we owe them a debt of gratitude. So not only did the resiliency process in this community during the crisis, was it impacted by communication, but it was also impacted by this identification as a community, as a collective community. This was one resiliency process that we saw from our informants, as well as our secondary sources, how to be resilient during the crisis. However, one of the things we started to see after we started collecting this data, and we saw it kind of at the beginning of our data collection, was that one resiliency process shifted. It shifted once the actual crisis wasn't a direct threat. So the fire was still going, but it wasn't directly impacting safety and it wasn't necessarily impacting housing or any type of structure. So once that direct crisis or direct impact stopped, the resiliency process changed. And the resiliency process actually went towards more of a wavering resilience with two ideas of feeling alone and then navigating the flood. One informant said, when the evacuation got lifted, it's almost like the apocalypse. There were no zombies, but there was nobody. It was very, very surreal. All the emergency staff had left. I can't even almost describe the feeling. It was desolate. The smoke was still there and there was no one. It was very creepy. We were completely disconnected. So because of the fire troops, the fire people, the fire leaders leaving 550 and leaving where people could see them, there was a sense of aloneness that happened. And that aloneness impacted the resiliency or the feeling of resiliency. 
Another informant said, the fire was not as stressful as the floods. Evacuation was the most traumatic part of the experience. We kept calm during the fire, but we lost it during the floods. So these floods that happened after, because of all this stuff that was happening, impacted our resiliency. It impacted the resiliency that we had built during the crisis. Another piece of this managing the continuous resilience process was about preparedness. So not only did our resiliency waver, and we had a tough time with that resiliency once the crisis wasn't directly impacting us, but we also started to feel things about preparedness. Specifically, we started to think about longitudinal impact in how we could build relationships for the future. One informant said, the 416 will be in our vocabulary for decades. You know, it's one of those things. Where were you when John Kennedy was killed? Where were you when the towers came down? So the 416 will be a part of the vocabulary of Durango. We knew that it was going to be this longitudinal thing, but after the direct impact, that impacted our resiliency process. And with that, another informant talking about building relationships said, one of the things we have been talking about is that you don't wanna be building those relationships with resources and crisis teams in times of crisis. You know, try not to build something from scratch. So when we looked at resiliency, we noticed that after this process, all of a sudden we cared about preparedness and we cared about the feeling of alone and we cared about the flooding, which impacted that really strong resilience that we felt during the actual crisis. This is just a quick synopsis of the findings that Dr. and Taylor and I um, developed in our, in our paper, but we wanna apply these findings so we can use them in these communities. One of the very distinct findings that we contributed or are contributing right now to how we see crises are is this idea of having different stages of crises. Now we know that there's been different stages and there's been many scholars have, who have put different stages in place. But what we found from our data is that the stages were connected to direct impact from the crisis. So we realized that before the crisis starts, and most of us know this, we need to be proactive rather than reactive. And this data would suggest that that proactivity needs to happen, especially with communication. So for example, right now, since we don't have any wildfires here in Durango, what can we do with communication so that when the fire happens or if it happens, people will know how to communicate? That will help that resiliency process. During the crisis, our data really suggested that identifying as a collective community was absolutely apparent and necessary to feel resilient, to know that everybody was in this together, we are working through this together and we were gonna get there as neighbors. We need to think about how we can support that and encourage it. And then the last piece of this, which is something that we're kind of both still stuck on is this after piece. So after the crisis, and I'm talking about after the direct impact, not when the crisis is completely over, but when the direct impact has, has been reduced, how can we keep a presence? So when the people that are leading this crisis management reduction are leading this crisis management, when they're taking a step back, how can we keep the present there to keep this resiliency going? And how can this resiliency remain strong after that? So in conclusion, with all of this that we've been um, dealing with in terms of the 416 fire and these crises that are happening around our world, one of our main contributions that we hope that everybody sees today is that the main practices that impact resiliency, whether it's before resiliency, during resiliency, or after resiliency, should prioritize maintaining a balance of emphasis on people, the economy, and the environment. We do a good job thinking about these three things together, but really when we're dealing with crises and how it impacts resiliency, we truly need to see this in the holistic sphere or really look at this from a holistic manner. Specifically, if we can think about people and the resiliency that's important with people and communities, we can see how that's gonna impact the economy and impact the environment. So with that, I wanna say thank you. Um, we appreciate being able to share our research. And if anybody has any questions. Oops. And I'm gonna try and get on the chat to answer some questions. Okay, there's a question for Dr. Taylor. All right, it looks like Mike has asked, are there examples of communities that use training and crisis response to support the local economies like communities that train vulnerable staff, uh, for an example, restaurant employees, to be able to respond to the crisis so that emergency response funds put locals back to work during the crisis? Um, I don't know of one off the top of my head that's really like the poster child for training 
um, line level employees. What I can tell you is that through my involvement with Visit Durango and also uh, my knowledge of the operation at the uh, Colorado Tourism Office level, we've become much more proactive than we were two years ago. And so I know in uh, spring of 19 and spring right now, there are these trainings happening. Um, we have entire uh, crisis centers, especially within the tourism industry that are talking about what our plan is for the summer if we were to have a repeat event like the 416 again this year. Um, and those resources are dialed in and shared. I know uh, at Visit Durango, we've been working on our crisis management plan since the fall to be ready for uh, the summer. And so um, I would say that part of that plan is providing resources to those line level employees. So people like restaurant employees, or like in the case of the Gold King Mine Spill, it was the rafting guides. These are the people who need the information to be active participants in the recovery. So I would say generally, um, as we mentioned, once you adapt from a crisis, it helps you plan for the next crisis. I would say that Durango is better positioned than we were a few years ago because we've used what we've learned to be more proactive for the next one. Okay, and I see a question here for me and it says, do you think improved communication in terms of post-fire effects or expected effects can help create better resilience in the post-fire stage of resilience? I think that would be an amazing thing. In our collection, data collection, it was really apparent um, how much communication was important. And I should say that I was affected by the fire like so many people in Durango and I was constantly looking at the communication that was out there. But when we talked with our informants and we really sifted through this, these secondary sources, we realized how truly important the communication was. And it's almost like having an overabundance of communication and giving the person the ability to choose which communication they wanna look through. But that communication gives a sense of control. And I think having it in that after phase would be so important because the more communication might help people to realize why the crews that they're seeing around and why the crisis management centers are kind of leaving their straight visualization, they're still around, but they're around in different places. So I think the more that we can communicate, the more that that calmness can happen. All right, another question has come in about the challenges that can occur when the scope of the response is too small, um, like that micro level business owner who's just thinking about their own business. Um, and what types of responses can occur when the scope is too large, when you have state or federal government who are making decisions in a crisis that's geographically specific? That's a really good question. Um, I can tell you back with the Gold King mine spill that Visit Durango had um, a comment that we said all the time and it was who owns the crisis? Who is the owner of the crisis? Whose responsibility is it to react and respond to this? And the truth is that everyone at all of those levels, big picture levels and individual business levels needs to respond, but they need to communicate with each other so that everyone's on the same page. What gets really tricky when you have those macro level decisions like state and federal government that are um, dictating uh, how resources will be spent, that trickles down to the micro level decisions and that can get really complicated. I think that everyone in each level should be making uh, decisions with the best information they have at the time. And the best information they'll have is if all of the different levels are communicating. And so that's a great question. But again, the context for each decision maker changes when everyone else makes a decision. There's also a general question, which I can talk about for a little bit. And then Dr. Taylor, if you wanna add on to it. The question is, are there trends regarding how crises change our sense of self and identity and how long does that last? The interesting thing about the crisis research and literature that we are working on right now and we're a part of is it's really new. Um, it's something that's building in popularity, obviously, because the crises are obviously expanding around our world. And as Dr. Taylor said, we got quite a bit of information from Florida as well as New Zealand and Australia. Um, but we really are in the infant stage in terms of research. And so that's something that we need to build on. I know that there is research regarding crises and anxiety or feelings of um, lack of control, but I don't know of any research regarding sense of self or identity, but I could see that working even from thinking about our research and how people reacted to our questions and how they led our interviews and what we saw um, in the secondary sources. I can see that being a predominant theme or probably coming out if we had collected more data or 
even compared it to different areas. So I don't know of any research specifically on that, but I think that would be something really important to research. A new question has come in that I don't know how to answer, and it is, does your research findings apply when there are multiple crises at once? For example, the challenge of managing a wildfire during a pandemic. And I, I know that probably everyone who will be watching this has that concern and what will be happening uh, this summer. Um, I. What I see is that uh, you would have all of the phases that would be occurring simultaneously and that you might be adapting from a pandemic while you're trying to absorb um, the, uh, a fire event. And in that, in, and in that case, um, your resources will be stretched very thin. And so a lot of the same people will be uh, using the same resources to recover from uh, different crises. And we hope that that doesn't happen. Um, and if it does happen, we hope that they don't happen in the same phase at the same time. And so um, I don't know about you, but I will say a little prayer that we are um, on the adapting phase and, and phasing out of the pandemic if we were to be faced with any uh, fire events this summer. It's a great question. I'd like to add on to that one a little bit too. I agree with Dr. Taylor. It's really hard to answer that one. Um, in our research fi findings were obviously very specific to wildfires. I think when we think about the findings in terms of the two different timeframes, so during the crisis versus right after the direct threat, when we think about during the crisis, the idea of communication and being a collective community, I don't see how that would be a negative, being this collective community, uh, making sure everybody's communicating. I think the thing with the pandemic that's a little bit um, challenging, and I think we're seeing this across our world, that the heights of the pandemic are at different time frames. Where a wildfire, the height, in, well, the wildfire we have experience with here at the 416, we did our research on, the height was in one area. So that didn't shift. We didn't have different groups of people doing different things necessarily. It was all one collective community. Um, so I agree with Dr. Taylor. It's the hope that they don't happen together. Um, but I can't, we didn't necessarily make the research so it was generalizable um, outside of the wildfires, but I can see crises having similarities based on our personal idea of resilience. And that's it for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right, awesome, wow, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Cartier and Dr. Taylor. Thank you again so much uh, for sharing your background and for detailing the findings of your research and fielding those questions. Um, I think we can all certainly appreciate your professional backgrounds and the research that you've done given that Durango's economy is so heavily influenced by tourism, which can be affected by crises like the 416 wildfire and by what we're all experiencing right now. So. Thank you again for, uh, for sharing that. And uh, I wanna say thank you so much to all of you out there who are asking questions, really great questions. Keep them coming. We really, um, we really appreciate that um, and, and, and uh, your thoughtfulness behind all of those. And so we're gonna go ahead and um, we are going to introduce our next speaker, Imogen Ainsworth, the city of Durango's uh, sustainability coordinator. So Imogen has overseen sustainability programs for the city of Durango since 2016, including recycling and sustainability outreach, energy efficiency initiatives, and greenhouse gas tracking and reporting. In 2018, the city of Durango launched resilience efforts with workshops focused on building organizational and community capacity. Prior to relocating permanently to the US, Imogen worked on municipal and nonprofit renewable energy programs in her native UK. Imogen holds an undergraduate master's degree from the University of Bristol, UK, and a master's in geography and natural resources management from the University of New Mexico. So with that, I'll go ahead and hand it off to you, Imogen.
Thank you. Hi. Um, yeah, so I'll figure out how to share my screen. Um, there we go. This should be good. So um, I first want to say thank you to uh, uh, Drs. Cartier and Taylor. That was super interesting research and um, it was great to hear about uh, your work. So thank you for sharing that. And then also to MSI um, for ensuring that this important conversation can proceed even in this time of great uncertainty. Um, as Emily mentioned at the beginning, while providing community support and emergency response is the top priority right now, it's also important to maintain momentum on other projects and long-term planning. So thank you for putting on these, this event. I also think that if there is a silver lining to this crisis, it could be that we've demonstrated what communities can do when they come together in the face of unprecedented challenge and uncertainty. There'll be lessons learned that can inform sustainability and resilience planning going forward. Uh, similar to the previous presentation, I also wanted to point out upfront that I'm not an expert in fire mitigation or management. And while I will speak a little to the work um, being done by other departments specifically related to wildfire adaptation and preparation, I'll be talking more generally to the work I'm doing around community resilience planning for uncertainty and climate change. Okay. So as the sustainability coordinator, my work has traditionally focused predominantly on climate mitigation type activities, such as waste reduction or energy efficiency. The city's municipal sustainability action plan, which was adopted in 2015, provides a strategic framework for organization wide integration of sustainability and sets out 181 individual actions under 10 overarching areas. This plan has guided much of the sustainability programs work over the last five years. Last year, with support from local scientists, the city conducted a community greenhouse gas emissions inventory. The inventory provides a snapshot of emissions in 2016 and acts as a baseline against which to measure change going forward. The city also completed a municipal greenhouse gas emissions inventory for city operations. And in August of last year, based on the inventory results, Durango City Council adopted community-wide and municipal goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 30% by 2030 and 80% by 2050 as well as to achieve a 50% uh, 50 renewable electricity by 2030 and 100% by 2050. There are many existing city initiatives underway that will contribute toward achievement of these goals, including implementation of the city's multimodal transportation plan, electric vehicle readiness planning, and an energy performance contract project, which will see significant energy and water efficiency upgrades at city facilities, as well as the installation of solar PV. In addition, the city is in the early stages of updating its sustainability plan to chart a course toward both municipal and community-wide emissions and renewable electricity goals. This updated plan will establish organizational and community scale key performance metrics and identify actions to reduce emissions and enhance sustainability. While, greenhouse gas emission, while reducing greenhouse gas emissions remain critical, the city also recognizes the need to prepare for and adapt to projected climate change impacts and to build community resilience. As in many communities, explicit work on resilience has originated from the sustainability office and been tied initially to climate change impacts. This is in part due to the underlying and pervasive impact of climate change across nearly all sectors, and in part due to the fact that both sustainability and resilience work are in their nature inter interdepartmental and multidisciplinary. While of course the city has always done resilience work in that it plans for and mitigates disasters and ensures continu continuity of operations in time of emergency, such as the 416 fire or the spread of a global pandemic, um, groups in the region began to organize more explicitly around climate resilience with the development of the 2011 Climate Energy Action Plan. The Climate Energy Action Plan was developed by a group of regional partners to provide a framework for countywide emissions reduction and climate change adaptation. The adaptation section of the plan was put together by a climate change preparedness uh, preparation work group using research by MSI and others to, assist vulnerable, to assess vulnerability and uh, develop adaptation strategies. While the science around climate change is constantly evolving and continued insufficient action at the international and national level, brings us closer to thresholds for catastrophic impacts with less time to correct our course 
the high level projections for our region remain much the same as they were in 2011. They include increasing temperatures. So a two degrees Fahrenheit warming has already been observed over the past century. Temperatures are projected to increase by an additional two to 10 degrees Fahrenheit by 2050, with summer temperatures warming slightly more than winter temperatures and 10 degrees Fahrenheit increases in average high and average lows by the end of the century. Temperature increase impact has impacts with vegetation, including shifts in tree line and an extended growing season. Second is precipitation changes. So while there is no clear projection for change in the total amount of precipitation falling, research suggests that a higher percentage of total precipitation is expected to fall as rain, leading to reduced snowpack. In addition, a higher percentage of total precipitation is anticipated to fall during extreme precipitation events, with a 10 to 20% increase in heavy precipitation events projected by the end of the century using higher emission scenarios. And then there's drought and wildfire. So increased temperatures leading to higher rates of evapotranspiration combined with reduced snowpack and earlier spring runoff are projected to result in reduced summer soil moisture and generally drier conditions on the ground. Research suggests that the area burned in the US between 1984 and 2014 was twice what it would have been without anthropogenic climate change, and wildfires are expected to increase in both frequency and severity. One of the key recommendations of the Climate Change Preparation Workgroup in 2011 was to develop a community climate adaptation plan. And while MSI did publish a forest and water resource adaptation plan, neither the Climate Energy Ac Action Plan nor a full community adaptation plan were ever formally adopted by the city of Durango. Despite this, the city has continued to work on climate adaptation and in 2018 received grant funding to bring in state and national experts to conduct Climate Change 101 training for department directors and other key city of Durango and La Plata County staff. Over the course of two workshops, staff learned about the projected changes in climate for our region and considered the potential impacts for municipal operations and for the community. This training has helped to build a shared understanding of the projected impacts and to begin to integrate resilience thinking broadly across city operations and processes. There are several existing city projects underway that will enhance Durango's climate resilience, including a recently adopted drought mitigation plan, climate adapted community forest workshop and wildfire mitigation initiatives. The drought mitigation plan was adopted in February of this year and takes into account future climate projections and its recommendation of actions to minimize the adverse impacts of drought on public health and safety, economic activity, environmental resources, and individual lifestyles during a drought event. The plan also recognizes that drought conditions in Durango may not be caused simply by a lack of precipitation, but could also be linked to wildfire either through impacts on water quality from upstream wildfire and debris flow, or through the diversion of water, for water resources for firefighting. Second, the climate adaptation, uh, climate adapted community forest workshop. So in December 2009, the City of Durango Sustainability and Parks Divisions partnered with CSU and the USDA Southwest Climate Hub on a local stakeholder workshop exploring the climate change impacts and adaptation strategies for the City of Durango's community forest. The workshop provided some key takeaways in that business as usual management practices are inconsistent with meeting the goals of the city's community forest management plan objectives under projected future climate conditions. And that there is the potential to work with local partners to begin adaptation now and therefore improve the long term adaptive capacity of Durango's urban forest. The workshop also yielded several next step actions that can be integrated into the city's sustainability and community forest management plans, including a revision of Durango's 10 year old tree and shrub guide in light of climate projections to include species adapted to warmer future climates, presenting an overview of key takeaways on climate change impacts and adaptation strategies to the city's park, parks and recreation boards, working with city parks and schools to test the suitability of future adapted tree species from southern seed sources, developing guidelines and outreach around green stormwater and low impact development options, exploring opportunities for citizen science and Fort Lewis College student projects to monitor urban forests. Just as the current challenge will provide learning opportunities for building resilience in the future, 
So the 416 fire in 2018 sparked region-wide activities around forest health and fire mitigation. The 416 fire brought together government agencies, non-profits and private entities to collaborate on forest health projects. The City of Durango Parks and Recreation Department has been active in these efforts and also in pursuing wildfire mitigation on city open spaces. In the months following the 416 fire, Durango Parks and Recreation staff began working with local partners to create the Fire Adapted Durango Partnership and identify priority areas for wildfire treatment where high density residential development backs onto vegetated city open space in Durango's Wildland Urban Interface or WUI. While the city has traditionally undertaken fuels management on city land, management in the WUI is a new program and has required extensive public outreach and engagement with residents. The city has been working with experts and communicating that the primary goal is not to clear cut or create a fire break, but to create defensible space around homes so that firefighters have safe access. Parks and recreation staff have also been working closely with wildfire adaptive partners who have been instrumental in talking to homeowners about responsible planting in their backyard and fire safe practices. This program will need to be flexible as treatment and retreatment schedules will depend on weather, snow load and other factors. The City of Durango Parks and Recreation Department has also worked with the Public Information Office and Streets Division to promote the creation of fire defensible space during the city's annual spring cleanup event, which began on Monday. The event provides City of Durango residents with an opportunity to dispose of yard waste, tree trimmings and branches, as well as furniture and other items. And finally, the City Planning Division will also be participating in the Community Planning Assistance for Wildfire program, which is being led by La Plata County. The program will develop recommendations on land use and building code adoption for high risk zones within the county's wildland urban interface, mitigation efforts and public outreach. So in 2009, an interdepartmental team of city staff also worked with the State Department of Local Affairs Colorado Resilience Office to develop a municipal resilience framework. The framework takes a broader view of community resilience without an exclusive focus on climate change impacts, with the intent being to draw connections between existing projects and programs and to identify gaps and opportunities for action. The term resilience has become somewhat of a buzzword in recent years and is used in a variety of different ways by, di by different fields. I often find that conversations around resilience center almost as much on semantics as they do on actions. And you're about to get your second definition of resilience for the night. And it's slightly different, <laughs> but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll deal with that as part of the resilience conversation. So for consistency, the city of Durango uses the Colorado Resilience Office definition of resilience as the ability of communities to rebound, positively adapt to or thrive amidst changing conditions or challenges and maintain quality of life, healthy growth, economic vitality, durable systems and conservation of resources for present and future generations. I also sometimes find it helpful to think about resilience in three buckets. And there's gonna be some overlap here again with the before, during and after concepts of resilience that were in the last presentation. So first, resilience to response the preparation for an immediate response to disasters or shocks, such as wildfire flooding or a global pandemic. Resilience determines how effectively a community is able to respond to unanticipated challenges. Second is resilience in recovery. This includes actions that a community can take to support recovery from a shock. These actions determine whether a community is able to bounce back or bounce forward to learn, adapt and thrive. Even as challenges emerge, we're thinking about how to come back stronger. And in situations such as the one in which we find ourselves now, we're thinking about what it might look like in a new normal, recognizing that perhaps something fundamental about the way we live and do business has shifted. And finally, everyday resilience, which is somewhat similar to the after, um, after resilience that we heard about in the last presentation. So this type of resilience involves work to build the capacity of a community or an organization to recognize and adapt to longer term change or stresses, such as aging infrastructure, rising temperatures or declining forest health. These stresses increase vulnerability and impact our ability to react to and recover from shocks. Actions that support everyday resilience enhance our collective strength and build flexibility into systems to ensure that they're able to adapt if needed when the time comes. 
In addition to the specific climate adaptation actions mentioned earlier, there are many other ways that the city can help to build everyday resilience. For example, through implementation of the housing and homelessness strategies. The Municipal Resilience Framework, which was completed in December, established a vision for resilience to key challenges, along with strategies and actions by which to reduce vulnerability and enhance the capacity to adapt. This approach recognizes that actions to adapt to or prepare for long-term change often have co-benefits in building resilience to other shocks and stresses. The city's vision for municipal resilience is that we are an organization that strives to cultivate and serve a community that is equitable, collaborative, connected, responsive, and adaptive in the face of change. The key resilience challenges were identified as unpredictability in funding for municipal operations. So the city is vulnerable to short and long-term shifts in sales tax revenue and external funding that impact its ability to provide key community services and plan for future uncertainty. Aging infrastructure, so critical infrastructure that is deteriorating or insufficient to serve the dynamic needs of a growing population. Water quality, due to a lack of diversity in supply and long-term water storage. And finally, climate change and drought, the anticipated impacts of which I've already talked about. The resilience framework identifies strategies by which to address the city's resilience challenges and move toward the overarching vision for resilience. So the first strategy that was identified was innovative, nimble and open. Be responsive and res be open and responsive to diverse perspectives and new ways of thinking. Build flexibility into city operations and processes. And an example action under this strategy could be to develop a mobile town hall engagement hub. So go to people where they are in order to enable all residents to learn about city processes and participate in decision making. This indirectly benefits resilience to all challenges by ensuring that the city processes are representative of the whole community. The second strategy was active strategic investment. Actively invest in community infrastructure, places and people for the future perform pre preventative maintenance and build redundancy into city operations and systems. An example action under this strategy could be to cultivate community resilience hubs in order to build resilience to shocks and stresses by providing resources, not only in disaster response, but also year round as trusted community spaces for information and resources. The third strategy was informed, empowered and collaborative community foster effective and inclusive communication that empowers all residents to collaborate with each other and with the city to create a more cohesive and adaptive community. An example strategy under this initiative, uh, example action under this initiative was to make it a party. <laughs> so to create opportunities for engagement that are fun and accessible to everyone. And the final strategy was prepared, prepare all segments of, of the community for uncertainty and disruption. And an example action under this one was neighborhood-based adaptation initiatives. So this could be anything from providing resources to neighborhoods for collaborative fire mitigation, water conservation, or community building activities. Many of the actions identified in the resilience framework are centered around innovation in the way we engage with the community. And while the framework does not explicitly call out actions related to climate change, the actions identified will enhance everyday resilience to all the challenges identified. The resilience framework is designed to be rapidly updated on an annual basis in order to reflect changing conditions and shifting community priorities, with actions being integrated into other city initiatives, including the updated sustainability plan. The sustainability planning process provides an opportunity to pilot some of the engagement strategies identified in the resilience framework to support the development of a plan that is equitable and effectively charts a course towards municipal and community wide emissions reductions. In addition, based on feedback received at an initial stakeholder meeting in December, the plan, while focused predominantly on strategies that reduce emissions, will also apply both resilience and equity lenses to all actions. This approach seeks to maximize co-benefits and minimize unintended ne negative consequences. For example, an adaptation to increase temperature could be to install air conditioning. However, this solution would result in increased greenhouse gas emissions and also increased costs for residents thereby placing a disproportionate burden on low-income residents. Another example could be adapting to increase wild fre wildfire frequency through fire suppression, which we now know is not a viable long-term solution. By considering emissions reduction alongside broader community resilience and equity, 
The hope is to create a second generation sustainability plan that works for the whole community and establishes a strategic pathway towards an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, while also enhancing our collective ability to adapt by building community resilience to change. And yeah, thank you very much for having me. And I think now I'll see if there are any questions. I can figure out how to open the chat. <laughs> there we go. So a question, in what ways can different entities support citizens in managing and engaging with uncertainty? It's scary to think about how lifestyles that we love could change as the result of a singular event, a wildfire or flood or a continuing process such as climate change. I think that's a big one. And I think a lot of the strategies that are identified in the resilience frameworks really center around the way that we engage with the community. And so I think similar to the last presentation where it showed that, you know, communicating with people is kind of the number one thing that you can do. I really think that's the way to, to deal with uncertainty. You say that it's there, you acknowledge that there is uncertainty um, and communicate with people as you move forward. So another question, has the city of Durango considered programs that inspire that expand wildfire mitigation to cross boundary efforts like the BLM county or other entities that manage land adjacent to city owned land. So I am not the fire mitigation expert for the city and that would really probably be a question better answered by our parks and recreation department. But I know that they are working very closely with um, public land owners, public and private land owners where, the, where it borders um, city, city open space. Another question, what has the community response been so far to the city efforts? For instance, are residents actively engaged or passively supportive? So we don't know yet because the, so the resilience framework was an internal um, process that was developed by an interdepartmental internal team and is really designed to be an internal framework. Um, the sustainability plan is really in right at the beginning stages and so we had intended to begin community engagement on the plan um, beyond the first stakeholder meeting in December. We had intended to um, kind of begin the broader community engagement this month. It's looking like, like many things that's going to be slightly delayed. Um, but we're hoping to get a survey, a high level survey out around Earth Day, um, which is this month to kind of begin that uh, that process of engaging the community. I know that generally um, we've had a lot of support for sustainability initiatives in general from the community. So if that's any indication, then um, residents have been actively engaged. So the next question, in regard to creating defensible spaces, do you know if residents are expected to pay for the entirety of those costs? Or do you know of any programs that can subsidize those costs? Again, I'm sorry, that would probably be a question for the Parks and Recreation Department. Um, I am not that familiar with the programs that are coming out of the city, but I know that, um, the, that the city has been working with Welfare Adaptive Partners on that as well. How does the city, another defensible space question, how does the city plan for continued defensible space needs needing to treat properties over time, what happens when private land is sold. I'm sorry, again, I'm not the, the wildfire mitigation expert on the city's projects. Um, I think our parks department is extremely knowledgeable and very helpful, and I'm sure would be happy to answer any other questions that there are around the defensible space programs. What are other cities doing to prepare for climate change? So, it, a huge variety in what other cities are doing. There are lots of cities that have never had a sustainability program and have never kind of integrated climate change into the way that they do business. There are also many that have done this for a very long time and have had climate, um, climate action plans or adaptation plans in place for a long time. Um, there's a big variety, but that, that also means that there's a lot of resources out there that, that we can draw on when we're um, looking at creating our own plan. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's so much research done around what kind of the high impact practices are for cities when looking at preparing for and mitigating climate change. Um, so we're in, a, we're in a really good place to be able to draw on all those resources. A question that maybe is for everybody. Okay. 
That's nice. Given that precipitation is likely to be more rain versus snow, and this could, gen uh, could create some changes in the localized water cycle, how do you see that impacting tourism and the local economy? I don't know if anyone else wants to take a stab, but I mean, the, the, the shift from, from rain to snow is obviously a big one for Durango's winter uh, tourism economy. And I think one that, um, yeah, that is gonna require adaptation uh, and resilience going forward. I don't know if anyone else wants to chime in on that. Sure, this is Lorraine Taylor. Um, we have been looking at research on how our seasons are changing, uh, both in the ski industry and even with spring hiking for wildflowers. People who've planned the same week to come hike for wildflowers every year for years are now missing the wildflowers. And so we certainly see that um, tourists themselves are adapting to these changes in our seasons. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of our seasons are shrinking, especially as it relates to what's happening on our river or on, at our ski resorts. Um, but the tourists are, are getting smart about that. But what we'll see probably is higher traffic in a shorter window of time, um, which tends to be unpleasant for the residents. And so um, that is certainly a concern how the uh, watershed will be changing in the future. So a general question for everyone. Why do you think there are a number of definitions for resilience? I can start if you like. I think that it's partly because different fields were already using resilience in different ways. So if you talk to someone in um, emergency management, they have been using resilience in one way. If you talk to um, our IT department, they see resilience as essentially redundancy in their systems. And so I think it's kind of a word that was had, had been like taken on by different fields um, and now there's this kind of bringing together of ideas and uh, in the sustainability and in terms of looking at climate change or just broader community resilience to change. Um, at least when I was in university there was this idea that resilience was the new sustainability that there was no longer possible to sustain and therefore we had to think about how we would adapt to change or how we would behave in a uh, sort of a new normal situation and to constant disruption. Um, I, there, I think it's okay that there are a number of definitions. I kind of uh, got, it's easy to get hung up on trying to figure out exactly what it means and be very clear about what it means, but you can end up, half this presentation could have been about what the word resilience means. And, and I kind of came to the conclusion that maybe it's okay that everyone has slightly different um, definitions of what it means for them. I think a lot of the actions and the solutions for building resilience have broad impact. And so maybe, maybe it's not that big of a deal. <laughs> I'd like to add something to that too. So this is Liz Cartier. I think in agreeing with Imogen, this idea of different definitions of resilience is a really good thing. I see resilience and resiliency as very subjective. Um, one of the things I teach is that the word leadership is subjective who I consider a leader, somebody else may not consider a leader. I think that resiliency is the same thing. We all have different levels of resiliency. We have different ways that we look at it. I think there is a collective understanding that it means um, sustaining itself or, or growing or getting through something. But I think that subjective understanding is what makes it unique and really powerful, especially when we're dealing with it in terms of crises. I agree, this is Lorraine Taylor, and just to add a little bit of cynicism to this conversation, academics really like to be famous for defining things. And so you have different academics in different fields that then become famous for defining resilience within their own field. And so um, there's a lot of overlap in the definition that we use and the one that Imogen presented today. Uh, but I do see that there's nuances in the fields and why people would want to propose a new one that's specific to their own area. I think this might be another general question. Um, so what supports or messaging exists to help people continue to engage with the potential for crisis and to be prepared as individuals and as a community, even in times of calm? 
I think that's a, a really interesting question and one that um, I think there are supports and messaging for that, but it's also something that we're trying to figure out how to do better. So a lot of the 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 um, actions in the resilience framework are really about doing that, how to message to people and um, kind of engage with the community. There's all kinds of research showing that um, the communities that are better connected to each other perform better in times of crisis or recover more, more effectively, more quickly in times of crisis. And so thinking about how to, how we as the city and we as a community can kind of build that community connectedness in, in times of calm, in times, in non-crisis times um, could uh, help build resilience in, in when we do face shocks or disasters as well. The presentation that, uh, that we showed tonight was related to secondary data with the Durango Herald articles, but there's another phase of our research um, that was related to social media. And we're finding that a lot of engagement and communication, especially during crises, because of how quick it is to post information and how quick it is to retrieve information is happening over social media. The 416 Fire Facebook page was incredibly active um, and was providing daily updates with the most current information. And when you think about the supply chain of information to go from the people who actually know what's happening to the user of that information, there's usually several links uh, that would happen and that would cause a delay. And so we have found that social media has really increased the speed of uh, communication and the information transfer. And I expect that our future crises will also be relying on social media to share information quickly. I agree with everything that's been said on this and kind of to jump off of what Dr. Taylor said with this idea of social media, it's really important to remember that social media is also a piece of our collective community. So we think of social media sometimes as an extension of ourself. So the more that we can kind of get this going and keep it going in that after effect before, or which the after becomes almost in a way before the next crisis, then it's really going to help us in that development of that collective community and to help us feel that preparedness that we need. I see a question has come in about uh, the destination image or branding that I mentioned. And uh, the question is, can a city or region rebrand itself as trailblazing in the form of sustainability or resilience building be a draw for tourists? And I would like to say yes. Um, there are certainly tourists who identify as sustainable tourists, green tourists, eco-tourists, mindful tourists, and they are seeking destinations that are aligned with their own values. And so I certainly do see that. Um, and there are destinations that are consciously making choices to avoid marketing to mass tourism and uh, rather looking for high value tourists, which is what a lot of destinations are seeking, including Durango. We want people who have similar values to our residents. They tend to have a better time and our residents tend to be happier um, when the visitors are also respectful of our resources. So I would say that Durango is actually uh, primed quite well with our existing resources and the values of our community to target those eco-tourists um, who would tread lightly uh, when they visit and tend to be more interested in getting to know the local people than you would with mass tourists. I might just chip in really quickly as well. So we just, um, uh, I have been working with Visit Durango on putting together a sustainable tourism working group that has not actually met yet, but we've been kind of brainstorming ideas around how to better integrate sustainability and the, the tourism world in Durango. And I think that working group could be a really good opportunity to kind of dig into more of the issues that, or the topics that came up tonight as well. So that's something exciting that's coming up. <laughs> All right, that was awesome. Thank you so much Imogen for sharing with us all of the amazing work and diverse set of projects that you have worked on and spearheaded here in Durango. We really appreciate that. And I wanna say thank you again to all of our, um, all the questions that 
came in from Mike and Lo um, and other viewers here on Facebook Live. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, we're finishing up a little bit early tonight, but uh, I think that's about, that's about it, folks. Um, I want to say uh, thank you so much for joining us um, for this second and our third Forest and Fire Learning Series. Um, but before you leave, um, I, I want to say don't forget to join us next week for our third and final installment in the Forest and Fire Learning Series. Uh, we'll be at the same place, same time. Um, and next week, we're going to delve into the social impacts of wildfire and what's happening with the community planning assistance with wildfire uh, here in La Plata County. Um, also, don't forget to enter for a chance to win uh, two single day stand up paddle boarding, kayak or canoe rentals from Four Corner uh, River Sports and two cases of Skagwa from Ska Brewing by one liking or following Mountain Studies Institute on our Facebook page. Um, and two, taking no more than two minutes to fill out our survey that's pinned to the comment section of this live broadcast. And of course, being 18 years of age or older. Um, I wanna say thank you again very much to our speakers, Dr. Lorraine Taylor, Dr. Elizabeth Cartier and Imogen Ainsworth. We deeply appreciate um, you bringing all of this information, your research and your work to our community. Uh, we really couldn't have put on this kind of event without you. So thank you so very much. Um, I wanna say thank you to all of our sponsors again for helping to make this happen. Oh, there's our, there's our free giveaway there. Um, and here's a list of our sponsors, uh, Wildfire Deputy Partnership, the Southern Rockies Fire Science Network, San Juan Citizens Alliance, Four Corners, River Sports, uh, Out, Durango Outdoor Exchange, Garden Sports Outdoors, Marie's Bookshop, Colorado State Forest Service, the Powerhouse Science Center, where we would have been hosting uh, this event if we could have, uh, San Juan Headwaters Forest Health Partnership, the 232 Cohesive Strategy Partnership, the Dolores Watershed Resilient Forest Collaborative and Ska Brewing. Thank you very much to all of you. We really deeply appreciate all of your support. And uh, I wanna give a big thank you to my colleague, Dana Hayward, who works with Mountain Studies Institute as the Forest Teams Partnership Coordinator uh, for all of her help with this project and behind the scenes work and for fielding Facebook questions tonight and for helping to make this a really incredible event. So thank you so much, Dana. Um, and my name is Emily Swindell. I am the Forest Program Associate with Mountain Studies Institute. And I appreciate all of you at home for uh, tuning in this evening. And um, we all wanna say thank you very much uh, for joining us. And um, we hope that you all stay healthy and happy and safe and sane during these times. And uh, we all look forward to seeing you again next week. So thank you so much. Take care.